Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back here. Um, I was here last, uh, I think it was in October 2015, shortly before the Paris Agreement, uh, speaking about prospects for the Paris Conference. Uh, and as you all know, of course, that conference uh, was successful in uh, leading to the adoption of the Paris uh, Agreement. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about now is uh, moving ahead now two and a half years. Where are we in the climate change process? Uh, what uh, has happened with the Paris Agreement? What are its prospects? Uh, going forward. Now, uh, I, Robert asked me to start with an overview of my book, uh, which Michelle just mentioned. And as she said, there are flyers over in the back uh, if you're interested in it. Um, so I'm going to start with an overview of, of the book just very, very briefly, uh, then talk about the future of the Paris Agreement, and then at the end focus a little bit on the situation in the United States. So to begin with the book, so the book is a general introduction to international climate change law. The title is uh, very descriptive, not very exciting, uh, but descriptive. Uh, it tries to provide a broad overview uh, to uh, specialists and non-specialists alike. I uh, try to give them a one-stop shopping for trying to understand international climate change law. Uh, the focus of the book is on the UN climate change regime, the progression of uh, instruments that's been adopted under that regime, uh, starting with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, then the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, the Copenhagen Accord, and then most recently, uh, the Paris Agreement. So the book focuses primarily on the legal instruments in the UN climate change regime, but it's also much broader. Uh, it tries to locate climate change law within public international law more generally. So there are several chapters uh, on general public international law and how it relates to climate change. Uh, it, it also looks at efforts beyond the UN framework convention process uh, in uh, uh, forms like the International Maritime Organization and the International Civil Aviation Organization. And then it also looks at the intersection of climate change law with other areas of international law. Um, so let me just briefly uh, talk uh, about the book, give you a little bit of an overview on it. Uh, so there are three different perspectives on climate change, and I think they're all reflected in the UN climate regime. Uh, one is an environmental perspective. The UN climate change regime has adopted an environmental goal of limiting temperature increase to well under two degrees. Uh, centigrade with looking at the possibility of going to 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, as a temperature goal uh, going forward. Uh, the means of achieving that environmental goal under the Framework Convention and the subsequent instruments uh, is to peak emissions as soon as possible, to have rapid reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, uh, to have carbon neutrality in the second half of the 20, uh, 21st century. Those are the goals, the emissions goals uh, under the Paris Agreement. So one perspective, of course, is an environmental perspective uh, on uh, the climate change issue. Uh, a second perspective is an economic perspective, uh, an economic perspective where, uh, as an economist, uh, economists would say you want to maximize benefits uh, relative to costs. Uh, the means of achieving that uh, economic goal would be cost-effective policies. Uh, a lot of emphasis on the climate change regime, as you probably know, on the use of market-based mechanisms, uh, such as emissions trading, uh, looking not just to carbon dioxide, but looking comprehensively across all gases, uh, sources and sinks uh, of greenhouse gases so that countries can choose where to reduce in the most cost-effective manner possible. And then finally, there's an ethical perspective where the goal is to uh, equitably distribute effort and costs. Uh, and the means, uh, as done in the climate change regime thus far, is by having some, uh, some system of differentiated obligations between states uh, to try to reflect equity and more recently to focus on the issue of loss and damages for damages uh, caused by climate change. Now, the history of the climate change regime, just very briefly, I'm sure you're all familiar. Uh, I call it a play in four acts, where the first act was the adoption of the Framework Convention, which established a system of governance. Second, the Kyoto Protocol, uh, legally binding targets. A third act was Copenhagen, uh, which uh, moved in a direction, a more bottom-up direction, excuse me, more bottom-up direction. And then uh, the final act is, uh, or the current act, hopefully not a final act, uh, is the Paris Agreement. So we try to understand uh, this progression of instruments in terms of three recurring themes that run through all of these uh, different uh, uh, instruments. Uh, one is the issue of legal bindingness, is the, to what degree is the regime legally binding? Uh, a second is the, the architecture of the regime. To what extent does it try to impose uh, uh, norms from the top down through international negotiations, to what extent does it allow countries to define uh, what they're doing through some kind of bottom-up, nationally determined process? And the third is differentiation. How 
uniform is the system, how differentiation is, differentiated is it uh, as between different states. So if you start with the framework convention, it's a treaty in terms of its legal bindingness, uh, but not all of its provisions are binding. It's largely a bottom-up regime uh, where countries get to define their own national climate policies. And in terms of differentiation, it's mixed. It established the annex system, dividing countries up into different annexes, develop, developing, uh, and countries, uh, OECD countries that had financial obligations. But then it also has common obligations that run across all countries. Uh, Kyoto Protocol moves in one direction quite strongly, in the direction of legal bindingness. The targets under Kyoto are binding. Uh, Top-down direction, uh, the targets that were uh, adopted in uh, Kyoto Protocol were internationally negotiated. And allied with that bindingness and top-down, a very bifurcated approach, that binding top-down uh, system applied to developed countries but not developing countries. With the Paris Agreement, we see a move back more in the direction of the Framework Convention. Uh, again, it is a treaty. Uh, unlike Copenhagen, it's a treaty, but not all the provisions are binding. It's largely bottom-up. Uh, the commitments are nationally determined, but there's a set of international rules uh, to try to bound that national discretion, and I'll be talking more about that because that's a lot of what the Paris uh, negotiation, rule book negotiations are about. Uh, and then it takes a very tailored or nuanced approach to differentiation. Uh, it goes, moves away from the annex system uh, that the Framework Convention established. Uh, it still, though, has bif uh, bifurcated uh, financial commitments, developed countries on the one hand, developing countries on the other. But in terms of the mitigation commitments, the commitments to reduce emissions, uh, those are not uh, bifurcated. Uh, those are essentially uniform for all countries. So we try to understand this evolution in the regime from the Framework Convention to Kyoto to Paris uh, through the lens of these three different variables. Uh, we also look, as I said, at efforts beyond the UNFCCC, um, the larger what's called regime complex. So it's what's going on in international organizations like IMO and ICAO and the Montreal Protocol. Uh, we also look at the multi-level uh, features of the regime. It's not just at the multilateral level. There's also regional initiatives, national initiatives, subnational initiatives. And I'll come back to that a little bit when I talk about the United States later in my talk. Uh, it's also um, uh, polycentric. There's no sort of hierarchic system of authority. There are all sorts of different interconnections between uh, different levels. And it's also multi-actor. So it's no longer simply states. It's also uh, of course, um, uh, business, uh, NGO, civil society more broadly. So the climate efforts beyond the UNFCCC, it's a very complicated picture with a lot of different stuff going on uh, that goes well beyond what the UN Framework Convention regime uh, does. Uh, and then finally, we look at intersections with other areas of international law in the book. So uh, we pick three. There are a lot of other ones you could focus on. Uh, we look at migration refugee law because climate change is expected to produce large-scale displacement of people. So how does international law address that? What does the climate change regime say about that, if anything? Uh, how do those two different regimes, the refugee migration regime and the climate change regime, relate to one another? We also look at the intersection between climate change law and human rights law because uh, climate change will both affect the enjoyment of human rights, like the right to food, the right to housing, the right to, um, uh, um, uh, to life itself in some cases. Uh, also, the response to climate change, mitigation measures raise human rights concerns. Uh, uh, um, growing lots of trees, uh, monoculture trees, can displace people and have human rights implications. So we look at the intersection between climate change law and human rights law. And then finally, we look at the intersection between the climate regime and trade law, which may be a subject we uh, discuss more in the Q&A later. Uh, but of course, climate change measures raise all sorts of trade issues. Uh, some of the measures that are talked about to deal with climate change, things like border tax adjustments, uh, uh, would raise uh, serious issues under the WTO. So we discuss some of those issues uh, in that chapter of the book. So that's to give you a broad overview of the book. Um, if you are interested in climate change law more generally, uh, it tries to provide a broad introduction uh, and really aimed at the general reader, not at the uh, highly specialized reader. OK, so uh, let me uh, turn now to the topic of today's talk, uh, the future of the Paris Agreement. Uh, and I want to take this in three parts. Uh, so first of all, I'll talk a little bit about what the Paris paradigm is. Uh, what was the basic essence of the Paris uh, Agreement? Uh, what were the challenges coming out of Paris? Uh, 
Uh, and then uh, what are the challenges uh, going forward? So to begin with, uh, what is the Paris paradigm? What was the structure that the Paris Agreement established? I talked a little bit about what that structure might look like uh, two and a half years ago when I was here before. And now we have the Paris Agreement so we can see uh, what came out of Paris. And I think there are three elements that I'd like to highlight of what I call the Paris paradigm. One is the hybrid structure of the regime. Uh, the second is its procedural orientation. And the third is the system by which it's trying to generate higher ambition over time, what's sometimes called the cycle of contributions or the ratchet mechanisms. So let me uh, go through each of these three uh, in turn. So first of all, the hybrid approach. Um, so we've seen uh, in many international regimes, including the climate change regime, uh, a choice between two different modes of operating. One puts a lot of emphasis on national flexibility, uh, the other on more uniform international rules. And different regimes reflect this more bottom-up versus more top-down element in different ways. Uh, the idea of national flexibility is to promote participation. Uh, more countries are going to be willing to participate, the theory is, if they have more flexibility in what they do. Uh, it allows greater experimentation. It's essentially a risk management tool for countries um, where uh, they have more flexibility, so they may be willing to take more risks. And the idea is that a more bottom-up system can produce higher ambition because countries are willing to do more if they have uh, more flexibility. Uh, on the other hand, you've got the more top-down uh, approach where you focus on uniform international rules. Uh, this has the strengths of promoting transparency and accountability. It's also promoting uh, comparability. It's easier to compare what countries are doing when it's more uniform. Um, uh, it also promotes reciprocity. Countries can make trade-offs where one country agrees to do X in return for other countries agreeing to do Y. Um, so we've seen uh, a back and forth in this, in the evolution of the climate change regime, where you started with uh, the framework convention, which is a very pretty bottom-up kind of regime, focusing mostly on national policies, pledge in, what's called pledge and review. Um, then you move to Kyoto, uh, you know, highly top-down regime uh, with legally binding internationally uh, negotiated targets. Uh, and then you have Copenhagen, as I said, uh, with more bottom-up pledges, with very, very few rules, which promoted a kind of a Wild West, uh, as we say in the US approach, where countries just got to do whatever they chose. And the idea of the uh, Paris uh, paradigm is sort of a Goldilocks solution along all three of the different elements that I mentioned earlier. Um, so in terms of uh, its um, uh, legality, its legal bindingness, uh, its nationally determined contributions, um, I'm sorry, in terms of its top-down versus bottom-up elements, uh, it's nationally determined contribution, so it's national flexibility. Countries get to decide what they're going to do. Their targets are not set by international negotiations. They're decided by each country individual, individually. But with international rules, unlike, Kyoto, unlike the Copenhagen Accord, the theory is with stronger international rules to promote transparency and accountability. And I'll come back to them uh, in a minute. Uh, in terms of bindingness, it's a treaty, but not all of the provisions are binding, so it's uh, splitting the difference in terms of its legality. And then with differentiation, as I said before, it's also trying to take a more hybrid approach. Uh, it has differentiation. Nationally determined contributions reflect self-differentiation. Each country gets to decide what it wants to do on its own, whether to take a target, do policies and measures, and so forth. Um, it abandons the annex structure. Uh, but it still has bifurcation of financial commitments. So it tries to take along all three of the different elements I mentioned something of a hybrid approach to try to promote uh, participation, and it's got amazing levels of participation. Uh, and I'll come back to it in a minute, but the US is still participating at least for the next few years. Um, uh, but uh, trying to balance uh, those efforts to get more participation with having a strong system of rules uh, to promote transparency and accountability. Now, those rules that are trying to promote transparency and accountability are largely procedural rules. So this is the second element of the Paris paradigm. Uh, it's largely a procedural uh, agreement. Um, the nationally determined contributions are not legally binding. Uh, the commitments are all of a procedural nature. So what do countries have to do? They have to communicate an NDC every five years, a nationally determined contribution. They have to provide information up front, ex ante, about what the uh, nature of their contribution is, so it's transparent, it's clear, it's understandable. Uh, otherwise, you don't even know what countries have said they're going to do. Uh, so they have to provide enough information so that it's understandable what they say they're going to do. 
Uh, they're supposed to report biennially, biennially on progress towards achievement of their NDC. It's not a legal requirement that they achieve their NDC, but they have to provide the information so you know, have they done, are they doing what they say they're going to do. Uh, they have to participate in uh, several different processes of, re of review, a technical expert review, a peer review, what's called the facilitative multilateral consideration of progress, uh, but it's essentially a peer review system, state to state. Uh, and then they're supposed to, uh, there's a global stock take uh, to assess progress, and then countries are supposed to come back and revise their NDC in light of the global stock take. And the idea of all this is to make clear what countries say they're going to do, uh, make sure you know whether they're actually achieving it so you can hold their feet to the fire and try to put pressure on them to achieve what they say they're going to do, and that's to promote accountability, and then to try to promote ambition through this system of uh, five-year cycles, where every five years there's a global stock take, see how the world is doing, and then uh, the presumption is uh, the global stock take will show that there's more is needed, and that will then put pressure on states in the next round to come back with stronger uh, contributions. Uh, and so this uh, third part of the Paris paradigm is what, uh, what uh, is usually referred to as the cycle of, contrib of contributions or the ratchet mechanism. Uh, and so this is just showing the different steps. Uh, uh, the principles behind this ratchet mechanism are in the Paris Agreement itself. There's supposed to be a series of progression. Each successive nationally determined contribution is supposed to be progress from the previous one. That's the idea of the ratchet, sort of a one-way moving up in terms of higher ambition. Uh, that's on the bottom left there, the principles. Um, and then there's uh, uh, your nationally determined contribution is supposed to reflect the highest possible ambition. So those are the general principles guiding this process, this cycle of contributions. But then you move from uh, having your nationally determined contribution with the information necessary to promote clarity, transparency, and understanding. Then you have the process of national implementation reporting back on what you're doing so countries can assess whether or not you've actually done what you say you're going to do. This process first of individual review, where each country is individually reviewed by technical experts, by their peers, by other countries. Uh, then a collective review, the global stock take, and then your next round of NDCs that are supposed to reflect highest possible ambition and uh, progression. Uh, so that, those three elements, I think, are the core of the ideas behind Paris. Uh, splitting the difference in all these very difficult issues of legality, bottom up, top down, and differentiation, that's the hybrid approach, uh, a largely procedural approach, uh, and then this cycle of contributions to try to get stronger ambition over time. So uh, there were three challenges, though, coming out of Paris, um, three challenges which I want to uh, just highlight, um, and that I think are behind sort of some of the current difficulties which I'll discuss in a minute. Uh, first of all, the NDCs are insufficiently ambitious, uh, as Michelle mentioned. There's what's called the emissions gap. Uh, second, uh, the model, of course, may not work. Uh, this whole idea that if you have a cycle of contributions, that will put sufficient political pressure on states so that they will, in fact, ratchet up their ambition over time. We don't know yet whether that's going to work or not, whether in the next round of NDCs, countries will, in fact, come back and have more ambitious uh, nationally determined contributions. And then the next cycle, they'll have even more ambitious. So we don't know. That's a, it's a theory. It's plausible. But it's, at this point, still, I would say, unproven. And then the third is, is this compromise as stable? Was there really a meeting of the minds in Paris, agreement on this new paradigm or not? So let me just uh, briefly discuss each of those three. Uh, so the first is the emissions gap. Uh, that, of course, is the overarching environmental problem with the agreement. Uh, the agreement doesn't do, and everybody agrees uh, with, on this, doesn't do enough. Uh, the goal of the Paris Agreement is to limit temperature to well below 2 degrees, not even just 2 degrees, well below 2 degrees, uh, with the uh, idea of examining the possibility of going to 1.5 degrees. Uh, so this is showing what the emissions pathways are up to 2030, which is where Paris covers up to 2030. Uh, the range of sort of emission scenarios that would keep us within two degrees and within one and a half degrees temperature increase. Um, these are the baseline cases with no uh, actions, uh, the current policy trajectory with existing national policies. And then this is showing the projected increases in emissions with what's called the unconditional and the conditional NDC cases. The unconditional is what states have said they're going to do unconditionally without any support. Uh, the conditional case is what states say they're going to do, 
if they did get financial support. This is for developing countries. So the unconditional case, higher levels of emissions. The conditional case, what countries would do if they got full support for it, uh, is shown with, uh, with the green here. So even the best case, though, the conditional NDC case, so this is what states said they're going to do uh, if they get support, and they get the support, so they do all the policy. This is with full achievement of NDCs. So these are, of course, questions, you know, will countries actually achieve their NDCs? But this is assuming everybody said, does exactly what they say they're going to do, full compliance. Um, you're still uh, more in the range of uh, three degrees or more rather than uh, two degrees, let alone one and a half degrees. And so there's a gap even in the best case of about 11 million, uh, 11 gigatons uh, of emissions uh, that has to be closed if we're going to, in fact, move from the current pathway or the Paris unconditional pathway to the two degree pathway. Um, and of course, you'd have to do even more, uh, more like uh, 16 gigatons emission reduction gap if you want to get onto a 1.5 degree uh, emissions uh, temperature change scenario. OK, so that's the challenge of the, the gap, the emissions gap. And the idea of Paris is to try to, over time, close that gap, uh, improve performance uh, so that we're on a better trajectory through the cycle of contributions. Uh, but of course, there's the question, will the cycle of contributions, in fact, uh, work? So the first cycle of contributions takes us to 2020. And then there are five-year cycles, then 20 to, 20, uh, 20 to 2025, uh, and then 2025 to 2030, and then just going forward over time. And so you have the global stock taking each of these, and then the new round of NDCs, which in theory is supposed to be pushing upward. So we're now in the midst of the first cycle, and <coughs> there's going to be the first of these global stock takes, except it's not called a global stock take. It's called a facilitative dialogue. It's happening this year. Uh, it's happening this year. It's been named the Talanoa Dialogue uh, because Fiji has the presidency of the Conference of the Parties, and Talanoa is, I guess, a process, traditional process in Fijian society um, uh, of discussion, sharing stories. So that first round of the Talanoa Dialogue happened last uh, Sunday, uh, week, uh, a week ago Sunday. Uh, and it's essentially, it's a sharing of stories is what it is. It's a sharing of stories where so countries spend a day uh, and also non-governmental actors spend a day sharing stories about challenges they have, uh, successes they've had, and so forth. This is not what we would call a rigorous process of examination, uh, but it's, uh, it's more uh, an idea of trying to build some sense of, I'd say, community, and some sense of shared understandings. Uh, there's going to be uh, the final phase of the Teleno Dialogue in uh, December at the Conference of the Parties in Poland. Uh, and then uh, it's still unclear exactly what the outputs of the facilitative dialogue, the Talanoa dialogue, is going to be, but presumably some kind of conclusions by the presidency, uh, possibly some kind of report. Um, now, one thing that's unclear is whether the Talanoa dialogue is going to be the same. The global stock take will be the same as the Talanoa dialogue. Uh, they have different terms used. Uh, facilitative dialogue is what we're in now. The first global stock take will be in 2023. Um, so obviously, though, the Talano Dialogue is going to be a precedent uh, for the global stock take. But whether the global stock take will be the same, uh, uh, as it is unclear. Um, there are going to be two more inputs for the Talano Dialogue that are going to be key, I think. Uh, one is the IPCC's 1.5 degree report, which is uh, going to be coming out in October uh, of this year. So shortly before the Bonn conference, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the Poland conference. Uh, so what the IPCC was asked to do was to examine uh, achievement. What would, what would it take to achieve uh, the 1.5 degree temperature goal? Uh, there have been uh, drafts of the IPCC report that have been leaked. Of course, the final report hasn't been finished. But I think, as everybody expected, um, what the IPCC is going to say is, Reaching 1.5 degrees is virtually impossible, but what it would take to reach 1.5 degrees, there's going to be overshoot of the 1.5 target. And then to get to it, one would have to have negative emissions. One would have to have large scale removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, uh, which would then bring the temperature back down to 1.5 degrees. Uh, this is likely to require some kind of uh, what is usually referred to as climate engineering techniques to try to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at a very large scale. Um, and so that, of course, raises its own set of problems. 
Uh, but we don't know yet, of course, what the IPCC final report's going to say. We just know what they're sort of thinking about saying so far in the drafts, which are still under review. Uh, another input for the, Talanoa, for the Talanoa Dialogue is the California Summit, which I'll also talk a little bit about at the end of my talk today, uh, which is a conference being held, uh, organized in, in California, uh, to try to bring uh, leaders together from government, from industry, from the uh, civil society, to try to have uh, uh, get commitments to stronger ambition. And then that pr uh, products of the California summit will be fed into the Talanoa dialogue. So this is the idea. Um, we'll see, of course, in 2020, whether countries, in fact, come forward with stronger NDCs. So I would say unclear at this point. But I think there's a serious cause for question as to whether or not there actually will be this ratchet up over time of the contribution the countries are making. And then the third challenge is, uh, is Paris paradigm stable? Was there really a meeting of the minds? Uh, Paris, I think, moved to a significant degree in the direction of the developed country vision of what the climate change regime should look like, uh, a stronger emphasis on mitigation than on adaptation or finance. Uh, the cycle of contributions I've talked about really applies primarily to mitigation and a big Big question. Uh, one of the things that really uh, is the most controversial in the Paris rulebook negotiations is whether you should have a similar cycle of contributions for finance as you have for mitigation. Uh, because the mitigation cycle of contributions is considerably stronger than what the Paris Agreement provides in terms of finance. Um, so, uh, so it moves in the developing country direction in terms of focus on mitigation more than on adaptation and finance and in favor and towards the developed country view on, on differentiation, because there's no bifurcation of the basic mitigation commitments uh, in the Paris Agreement. Um, there's though a lot of what uh, I think Michelle referred to as constructive ambiguity. Uh, this is a, uh, whether it's constructive or not, I guess is a, a subject to the reader, uh, subject to different views. But the idea of constructive ambiguity is, you need to have ambiguity because there's, in fact, not a meeting of the minds. So you need to have enough ambiguity so that everybody can declare victory, interpret the provisions in the way they want, and then go home and say they've done something. Uh, but of course, that then just defers the issues until later. Uh, the issues don't go away because there was, in fact, no real resolution of the issues. There was a formulation that can be subject to differing interpretation. So there is some constructive ambiguity in the Paris Agreement, which developing countries uh, really focus on because they are trying to, I would say, move the Paris paradigm back from the, the way I've characterized it here in a direction that has more bifurcation and that has more focus on finance and adaptation, uh, not only on mitigation. Okay, so where are we now? We're now in the process of elaborating the Paris rule book. Uh, this is just listing a whole series of different issues, and I'm not going to go through all of these, but just to sort of I uh, have a, a listing here of the different issues that are in the Paris Rulebook negotiations. Lots of different issues where the Paris Agreement establishes some general rule, but then how you operationalize that's going to require a lot more. So you're supposed to do accounting of your, uh, of your emissions uh, in terms of whether you've achieved your NDC, but exactly how that works uh, remains to be determined uh, if it's going to be set at the international level. Uh, there are market mechanisms, but there are no rules for how those market mechanisms will work at the moment. So a lot of different issues where the Paris Agreement sets some general rule, but at a pretty high level of generality, where the idea is to try to flesh it, the rule out, give it more precision through the negotiation of what are called modalities, MPGs, modalities, procedures, and guidelines, um, which will spell these rules out. So, uh, the problem in the rulebook negotiation is uh, the issues I mentioned before, where Paris tries to get a Goldilocks solution to, uh, they're still issues. Uh, they haven't gone away. And so the three issues I've highlighted throughout the talk today, uh, legal binding, this top-down versus bottom-up and differentiation, they're all still huge issues in the Paris rulebook negotiations. Uh, it's not that Paris has solved them. So the Paris Agreement, uh, has the procedural obligations being binding, legally binding. It authorizes the conference of the parties to adopt legally binding rules, fleshing out the, these, uh, the Paris provisions. So the Paris rule book could be legally binding in most cases, but will it be legally binding? A lot of countries don't like the idea that they're going to have legally binding rules 
applying to what they report on, applying to how it's reviewed, how the accounting system works. So there's a big issue as to whether or not the Paris rules will say shall or should or may. May is simply optional. You know, you may do it, it's just illustrative, but whether you do it or not is up to you. Should is at least pushing in the direction that you should be doing it, and shall would be the language of legal obligation. So in every Paris rule book negotiation you know, room, there's an issue. It's mostly been bracketed so far, but it's going to be an issue they're going to have to resolve at the end uh, about what level of legal bindingness the Paris rules will have. Um, how much should the Paris rule book, how detailed should it be? How much should it try to really define what the accounting rules are, what the reporting rules are? Uh, or how much should be left, basically, for countries to decide how they're going to do their own reporting? Uh, how they're going to do their own accounting. So this is the same top-down versus bottom-up uh, issue. How much will countries get to nationally determine about how they implement the Paris uh, procedural obligations? How much will be internationally defined? And then finally, on differentiation, uh, same issue. Uh, uh, will the Paris rules apply to countries the same, all countries? Uh, will they apply to developing countries different from developed countries? Will there be different rules? Uh, different rules for what the developed countries have to do in terms of reporting and accounting, transparency, and what developing countries have to do. So the issue of differentiation, which Paris seemed to represent a, a, a sort of a step change in how it's been addressed, we're right back where we were before in some ways uh, as pre-Paris. Um, so these rules issues haven't gone away. Uh, I said after Paris, you know, the question's going to be, did Paris really resolve the issue so we can now move to a more technical discussion, or will it still be a political discussion? And I think the Paris rulebook negotiations pretty strongly demonstrate that we're still in a political uh, discussion. We haven't moved to simply a technical discussion about how you uh, implement Paris. Um, so there's a lot of challenges in completing the Paris Agreement work program, the Paris rulebook. Uh, there's the political issues, what some see as an attempt to renegotiate Paris by having different, uh, having a lot of differentiation by not having much legal bindingness, by um, uh, shifting the focus or having a lot more in finance and adaptation that the Paris Agreement specifically provides for. Um, there's a lot of issue linkage, so developing countries are very concerned that there's not enough attention to finance, so the question is do you hold up progress in every other issue until finance moves ahead or adaptation moves ahead? So there's a lot of issue linkages, very hard to get progress in any group uh, because virtually everybody's unhappy with progress in some other group. So then you hold up progress uh, in, in, in the groups that you don't care about as much to try to get more progress in the groups that you do care about. Uh, there's a lot of technical complexity. So it's not just a political problem. It's also a technical problem about you know, how you elaborate the accounting rules, how you elaborate the reporting rules. Um, I think there's, the, you know, these people have been negotiating a long time, but they spend most of their time just making the same statements over and over again. So there's not even very good understanding, I think, among a lot of the negotiators about the technical issues that they're trying to resolve. And then there's simply a procedural mechanical problem. Uh, the Paris rule book's supposed to be wrapped up in Katowice, Poland in December. That's only a six, seven months away. There's only going to be one more round of negotiations between now and Katowice. They have a 165-page document coming out of the bond meeting. 160 has that's not even in the form of a decision, not even a legal form. It just is a big mess of different elements and, you know, uh, 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 with very little uh, weeding out. So it's not even clear what the structure of the Paris uh, decision is going to look like. Uh, so just they only have two more weeks of negotiations to try to go through 165 pages and convert this big amalgam of stuff into some text they can actually adopt in Katowice. So there's a huge just just a question of time, basically, to get from where we are now to a rule book uh, coming out of the Poland meeting in December. OK, so finally, let me just say a few, uh, little bit about the US situation, because I'd say accentuating these challenges I've mentioned before, the uh, problem that uh, there's the gap, the questions about the cycle of contributions, uh, the uh, continuing political differences, because Paris really didn't resolve uh, most of the issues in any kind of way that countries are totally satisfied with, or at least some countries. Adding to all that, of course, is the U.S. situation where under President Trump, the U.S. is both rolling back policies at the international level as well as at the national level. So let me talk about that because that really also is another thing I think that makes the whole negotiating process on the Paris rulebook more difficult. <clears throat> 
Um, so I think it may be useful to just separate out what the Trump administration is doing internationally and what's happening domestically in the US. Um, so internationally, I think the most immediate problem is the US has uh, not going to make the second part of its contribution to the Green Climate Fund. The US said it was going to contribute $3 billion. Uh, the Obama administration, before it left office, gave $1 billion of that. There's still $2 billion left, and the Trump administration has said they're not going to give the $2 billion. So that, of course, then has ripple effects uh, throughout the process because developing countries are unhappy to begin with, with the state of financial contributions. So $2 billion represents, I think, 20% of the overall funding in the first phase of contributions to the Green Climate Fund. So it's a huge hit the Green Climate Fund is taking. Uh, and this is an immediate effect because the US is already, you know, this is happening uh, right now. So I think that makes the negotiations more difficult because developing countries already felt you know, they're, what they're supposed to be getting out of this process, which is more financial contributions, more financial support, is being undermined uh, by the US decision not to fund the Green Climate Fund. Then there's the longer term prospect of the US withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. So the US is not out of Paris at this point. Uh, President Trump did not withdraw the US from Paris. He simply announced that the US would withdraw. Well, the US would give its notice of withdrawal when the Paris Agreement authorized it to. That doesn't take place till 2019. That's the earliest you can give your notice of withdrawal. You have to give one year notice so the withdrawal doesn't take effect till 2020. So unless something changes, unless the Trump administration changes its uh, view, the US is going to be in Paris through 2020. And of course, the US is, would only be out of Paris if, in fact, Trump follows through and does give notice of withdrawal. It's more than a year away. The Trump administration changes its policies on a you know, weekly basis. So whether, in fact, the Trump administration will withdraw from Paris in 2019 or not, I think it's still an open question. And the Trump administration has made some noises that it would be willing to stay in Paris you know, if it gets a better deal. So that's still, I think, uh, after the Paris rule book negotiations are finished, you know, maybe there will be some uh, appetite to at least make some tweaks that would allow President Trump to declare victory and stay in Paris. So, Unknown, uh, but of course, he's made the announcement, so that does have effects. Um, and I'd say the effects, and the effects are really on uh, how engaged the U.S. What kind of leadership role can the U.S. play in the negotiations? Um, so, uh, in terms of the negotiation of the Paris Rulebook, uh, U.S. now sends a much, much smaller delegation. It's still actively involved. It still basically has exactly the same policies uh, it's putting forward in the Paris Rule Book negotiations that it had under the Obama administration, because the basic approach of pushing for transparency, pushing for market-based approaches, hasn't changed. That was a, basically a bipartisan approach to the uh, uh, climate negotiations since the first Bush administration. Uh, so that's stayed the same. There's been no new instructions as far as I know. But the U.S. is less involved. So to the extent that you see the negotiations as sort of a back and forth, uh, the U.S. Uh, doesn't play nearly as much of a counterweight uh, to China and other developing countries as it did when it was more fully engaged uh, pre-Paris. Uh, then there's the question of ambition and whether or not there's going to actually be the cycle of contributions will work. Uh, so far, there's been no sign of backtracking of the existing NDCs. Uh, no countries haven't been withdrawing their existing nationally determined contributions. But in the next round of NDCs aimed at ratcheting up, uh, first of all, there's going to be no U.S. push at all for stronger contributions since the U.S. isn't planning to make one. Uh, to the extent there's reciprocity in the regime where countries are willing to do things in exchange for other countries, if the U.S. isn't going to do something, that, of course, is going to lower the likelihood that other countries will come forward with uh, ambitious pledges. I'd say the one bright spot on the horizon on the ambition issue is a lot of taking place at the state and local level. And the US uh, states and localities, things like the California summit, are trying to highlight that as a way to show that you know, it's not that the US is doing nothing. The US is doing something, maybe not at the federal level, but at other levels, hopefully as a way to reassure other countries that the US isn't completely uh, derelict in trying to do something on the climate change issue. Uh, the U.S. Trump administration, though, is also doing a lot domestically, trying to roll back Obama administration regulations, the Clean Power Plan, and the auto emission standards. Uh, this is going to require new regulatory rulemaking, so it's not the case that these standards are out already. Um, these are, again, intentions to roll them back in the future. Uh, it's going to be a laborious process to do new rules to replace the existing rules. 
likely to be a lot of court challenges. So it's going to take a long time before the existing rules are actually changed. <laughs> In the meantime, though, the Trump administration can basically uh, not do much to implement the existing rules. So even though the existing rules are in place and will be in place until they're uh, succeeded by some other rule, uh, not as much is taking place on the implementation front to make those rules actually effective. And then finally, oh, and, and I'd say the biggest one here probably is the rollback of the auto emission standards, uh, which the Trump administration has announced, because in the US now, transportation emissions are the largest source of emissions in the US, more than the power sector. So the rollback in vehicle emission standards is huge in terms of trying to get the US onto a better emission trajectory. And then finally, um, the U uh, Trump administration is trying to limit what states are doing by uh, withdrawing the waiver that allows California to have its own auto emission standards. So not only is the Trump administration rolling back the federal standards, it's also attempting to roll back state standards. Um, oops. So there are a lot of non-federal initiatives, though, to try to compensate for <coughs> the Trump administration actions. There's the We're Still In coalition. Uh, there's America's Pledge. Uh, there's the US Climate Alliance. Uh, there's the Global Covenant of Mayors. Uh, so these are all actions <coughs> at the non-federal level, at the state and local level, also by uh, business and civil society actors. At the um, Bond conference, um, I think the biggest pavilion of the Bond conference was the US pavilion. When I got there and somebody said, that's the US pavilion, which was huge, I said, how is the US having a pavilion? Because the US Trump administration doesn't believe in climate change. Well, the US pavilion was funded by um, Jerry Brown and Bloomberg, I think largely Bloomberg. Um, it was a non-federal uh, pavilion of states and localities and business. Uh, they put it, though, the secretary did this thing, put it right next to the governmental part of the site rather than the non-governmental sector of the site. So it was like an alternative government, like an alternative world walking into the U.S. pavilion. It was all the ex-U.S. negotiators who've left and then a huge variety of other actors. Um, and I think that was part of the we're still in America's Pledge combination. So America's Pledge um, covers uh, non-federal actions and it represents a huge uh, amount in terms of GDP and uh, emissions. So if uh, the nut, we're still in America's Pledge Group were a country, they'd be the third biggest economy in the world after the US and uh, China, uh, bigger than Japan or Germany. Uh, in terms of emissions, they'd be fourth uh, in terms of global emissions after China, the US, and India. So we're talking about you know, not the whole US, obviously, about half the US, but still a huge actor. Uh, to the extent it's effective in reducing emissions. Um, there have been a lot of state actions. California has extended its uh, emission reduction programs through 2030 with, I think, a pledge of 50% reductions by 2050. Um, uh, New Jersey and Virginia are joining a regional greenhouse gas trading scheme where that's at least expected. It hasn't happened yet. Uh, some kind of states are uh, uh, continue having subsidies to try to keep nuclear going. Uh, and California and 16 other states are suing the EPA to block the weakened vehicle emission standards. So there's lots going on at the state level, which is some counterweight at least to the lack of action at the federal level. And then finally, California summit, which I mentioned, it's going to be September 12th to 14th. Again, that's largely Jerry Brown, governor of California, and uh, Michael Bloomberg, the ex-mayor of uh, New York. Um, and it's going to bring together state and local leaders, business scientists, environmental groups. And the idea is a call to action for stepped up ambition, which will lead into the Talanoa dialogue and then lead into the next set of NDCs, which are going to be in 2020. So that's uh, just an overview of uh, sort of where we are internationally, a little bit on where we are in the US at least, uh, and how that affects the international process. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions.